Thank you for your enthusiastic response to Restoring Health Holistically. I would just like to make clear that I am not a medical practitioner. In order to heal my own illness over the past 17 years, I've become a holistic health author, educator, and an advocate. But this does not provide the depth of knowledge that's needed to treat illnesses. I research any illness I have, and then I make an appointment with a holistically trained practitioner to discuss a treatment plan, and this is a collaboration between you and your doctor. Western medicine primarily treats symptoms with drugs forever. I prefer to seek practitioners who are trained to treat the causes of illness so that I will get well. The titles that I look for are naturopathic doctor, or ND, functional MDs, orthomolecular doctors, chiropractic neurologists, and certified energy medicine practitioners. These TV shows are intended to raise consumer awareness of holistic treatments and explain how they work so that you can make informed decisions and find a practitioner to work with and get well. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Gracelyn Guile. Welcome to Restoring Health Holistically. And this section is called Ask Gracelyn because after three years of me interviewing holistic practitioners on this show, you finally get to ask me questions. Um, to help you do that, I'd like to introduce Lois Arias, my Facebook page manager. Thank you. And she is with me through this whole series because how it works is you go to the Facebook page, submit your question, she collects them, brings them to me, and then we fit them into a upcoming show. For those of you who are new um, to this show, I ended my bipolar symptoms in 2002 using only holistic treatments, and it took me a couple of years to find the solutions. Um, I have written two books on healing mental illnesses without drugs and given seven-hour lectures to medical practitioners on that same topic. Um, but here in this show, we're not answering just questions about mental illness because I have been using holistic medicine exclusively for 17 years uh, and have a great deal of interest in it. Um, I am not a practitioner, but I am an a knowledgeable advocate, and I'm happy to answer people's questions about whatever condition they have, um, with the understanding that you also need to see a doctor, but I can maybe point you in the right direction. So let's get started with the questions this week. What prepared you to help other people who are suffering? You know, I'm. That was an interesting question for me to answer, and I don't have a really clear answer because it was an accumulation of life experiences. But I think it really started with my dad, who was a farmer. I grew up on a farm, and it was in a, you know, a, uh, 60 years ago. It was a little, quite a different um, upbringing than what kids experience today, even those on farms, because you have all of the exposure through television and media and um, electronic gizmos that just didn't exist then. But um, I observed, living on a farm, that um, whenever anything happened, there was a cause. And so I became accustomed to cause and effect. And so it was natural, logical to me, when I got an illness, to try and look for the cause of the illness and solve that rather than treating the illness forever with medications. Um, the other thing that came to mind in this question is that my dad was, um, he was a, a regular farmer, but one who loved animals and treated all animals on the farm, whether they were his domestic animals or whether they were wild animals that wandered through and helped themselves to some of the food, with a great deal of respect and compassion 
and enjoyment. He just loved animals and he loved people. So his, um, his love of living beings, I think, uh, imprinted in me at a very young age. And so I just, when somebody's having a problem, it's my, it seems to be my nature to just want to help them with it. So that's how, what propelled me. And then all of my own illnesses gave me a lot of information to share with people that seems to have value. So that's what got me into this racket. I'm glad you are in the racket. <laughs> Thank you. I'm plagued by tight muscles in my legs constantly. I stretch as much, much as I can. The muscles on the sides of my lower legs will occasionally seize up so bad they pull my foot sideways, and it's extremely painful. Sometimes even my big toes cramp up. I eat bananas, but I take, I can't eat bananas, but I take a high potency multivitamin, eat lots of leafy greens, and drink plenty of water. Do you have any other suggestions? Yes, I have several suggestions because I experienced this too. And recently, um, since I'm returned to, started playing tennis year round uh, to increase my aerobic exercise, um, I'm finding that I'm experiencing the cramping in the lower legs as well. So um, my first thought for myself was dehydration since I've experienced that as a gardener and it does cause fainting, but it also can cause cramping. And I asked, I had several friends a um, year or so ago that were, their Achilles tendon snapped. And so I asked a physical therapist friend of mine, what would cause that to happen in so many of my friends? And she said, dehydration. All of your muscles and your tendons and everything in your body needs adequate fluid or it it's like leather that dries out, you know, so it will snap if you don't have adequate hydration. But it's not just water, too. You, When you're sweating and when you're exercising, you're sweating out minerals. And so um, you, you're taking a potent multivitamin and mineral, but that may not be enough minerals for the athletic person that you are. And so you may have to... Um, drink more uh, liquid minerals. Uh, you can get elect you can get them in electrolyte powders or you may go to a fitness uh, store where there are guys working out that are using a lot of more of liquid supplements rather than uh, capsules and um, individual supplements for this purpose. Um, you want to make sure to get the minerals. They are the electrolytes that collect, uh, that connect the um, electrical impulses throughout your body. And so when you don't have adequate minerals, things don't communicate very well. And that, I, I'm not sure if that's what causes the cramping, but I would, we know the two are related. So um, you want to make sure that you're getting sodium, enough salt especially. Um, because your blood pressure will drop and you may feel faint or weak or tired all the time if you do not have adequate sodium. And this is counter to what, when people eat a lot of processed foods and a lot of refined foods and a lot of restaurant foods and a lot of fast foods, they have way too much sodium. So it's unusual for us to hear from our doctors, well, are you getting enough salt? But you really need it. And so if you're an athlete, if you're physically active and you don't eat a lot of processed foods, you need to increase your intake of salt. And um, I use um, um, natural sea salts. And I like the pink Himalayan and I have a Celtic sea salt that I'm very addicted to because it has more flavor than regular salt because it has other minerals in it as well. So find a salt that you like and make sure that you're your sodium levels are high enough to keep your blood pressure in, in place, and that may help too. Um, I also learned from muscle cramps many years ago that um, magnesium is really important in uh, stopping cramps. Mm -hmm. And um, I took a magnesium supplement. I'd take 250 magnesium for every 500 milligrams of, um, of calcium so that you keep the two in balance. Some say you could do a one-to-one -one ratio. I didn't try that. Um, 
but it didn't seem to help that much. And so I started, I knew that nuts, which I love, are loaded with magnesium. And so mm -hmm. I just started trying to eat a handful of nuts every day. And then I also did Epsom salt bath because Epsom salts is filled with magnesium. It's a good detoxer and you can absorb the magnesium through your skin and get it into your system quicker. So those are other things that you can try. Uh, in my own cramping, uh, tennis leg cramping search for solutions this year, um, I went looking for uh, what Dr. Oz would recommend and um, up popped the magnesium sub supplement MG Bright. And then it has oral magnesium bound to malate that is highly absorbed. So, but when I went to that site, uh, www.mgbright.com, up popped a free 23 page document called The Ultimate Guide to Muscle Cramps. Mm. Sounded like my kind of book. So I started looking through it. It's very well researched, but to my surprise, and I, this never occurred to me, ha the first half of the book was all about which medications, specifically naming them, can cause a magnesium deficiency and can cause cramps, muscle cramps. And so, um, Blood pressure medicines, statins, diuretics are all covering those pages, amongst others as well. So if you have, I suggest that the person that submitted this question go to this site because it's much more comprehensive and what you realize, and when you're dealing in holistic medicine, what you know is that any symptom can be caused by any different number of causes, and they will be unique to each individual. So for this person who submitted the question, I suggest that you go to this booklet to figure out what might be your cause, since your cause may be very different from my cause. Why is autism becoming so common? I'm asked that a lot, and um, this is going to be a little lengthy answer, but I think it's important because it applies not just to autism, but it also applies to other mental diagnoses. I will talk specifically about autism, but a lot of the causes that contribute to autism also contribute to all the other mental illnesses. Um, in America, one in every 68 children in America is now being diagnosed as on the autism spectrum. Uh, this is a 10 times increase in the past 40 years. It's one in every 42 boys and one in 189 girls. And so there is obviously something that the, the sperm and the egg and the sex, the gender of the child has something to do with it. But the bigger question is, what happened in this country 40 or 50 years ago? And that puts us in the post-World War II era. And what happened is that a lot of the, um, they were testing a lot of chemicals for war, for use in the war, because they felt that Germany was going to go to chemical warfare. And as they tested these, they tested them on uh, these chemicals, they tested them on bugs. And they learned that a lot of them were killed bugs very quickly. So we didn't go to chemical warfare that I know of, on at least not on a large scale. But after the war, these chemicals were made into pesticides that are now sprayed on 80 some percent of all the food that we eat. And so we have this chemical assault that none of us are aware of that's been going on for all of these years. And what happens is that in the mother's chemical and toxic load, is passed on to the fetus. And then once the baby is born, they add their own toxic load in their lifetime. And so in the 2000 range, they tested a, um, an organization, the Environmental Working Group, tested the umbilical cord blood of 10 newborns chose at random. And they found over 187 different chemicals in the blood of newborns that it had no exposure outside the womb to chemicals. 
And so uh, what I believe is that because of how toxins impact the body, I think that the chemical load of all these generations that's been building through each generation since World War II, we are now carrying a toxic load that the tiny fetus and child uh, cannot handle. And so they are experiencing toxic overload at a time that they don't have the immune systems or the um, bodily systems to throw, developed enough to throw them off. And so this is contributing. Environmental toxins as a category is contributing directly to this uh, epidemic of autism. But that's not the only thing. Seldom is there one thing that is the cause. But that's a major cause, and it's being acknowledged by neurologists as, you know, they don't equate it to World War II. They're just saying the toxic, environmental toxins have a big role. Um, both of my books have uh, chapters on how toxins impact the body, and they're available on my website. Um, we are using, it is estimated, we have 80,000 different chemicals that are being sold and used today and around the world. Uh, nobody knows for sure, and most of them have never been tested for safety because that wasn't required many until recently, so, and not all of them are tested even recently. So there's very loose regulation of these. So uh, chemicals, in addition to street drugs, um, in addition to the medical drugs the, that people are taking, as they're chemicals too. Um, the National Ambulatory Medical Care Survey of 2010 showed that um, physician office visits resulted in 2.6 billion drugs being ordered in one year. So it's not just environmental toxins, it's ingested chemicals that are prescribed by doctors and being used for mainstream medicine, medical treatments, whether or not they are the best remedy remains debatable. Um, so you have all of that chemical addition, street drugs, tobacco, which is very carcinogenic in the body. You have chlorine and fluoride that is added to the water and uh, calcifies um, some organs. I was working last week on decalcifying um, some of my innards and read that fluoride contributes to that. Artificial sweeteners, MSG, and hundreds of food additives that are also not regulated very well. This toxic load and changes in our culture are overwhelming all of our body's ability to heal and to function. And I believe that is why there is an obesity epidemic, there is a diabetes epidemic, and there is an Alzheimer's epidemic as well. And we're seeing the environmental toxins in PS, PTSD in veterans epidemics. So we're really a sick nation, and we spend more than any other country on health care. And we're the sickest. We're like 37th. So um, autism children are like the canaries in the coal mine. They're really calling our attention to this fact that uh, we are overloaded with toxins, and, they're, and it's self-induced. <laughs> so uh, just this week, I was reading a fascinating chapter in uh, Dr. Perlmutter's new book. This is uh, Dr. David Perlmutter. You see him on PBS frequently. Um, his book, Brain Maker, is um, he wrote Grain Brain, and that's what he's noted for. Um, it was a bestseller, but Brain Maker is the latest one, and it has new research that show that our gut bacteria is definitely connected to brain development. And there is evidence linking the intestinal microbes with autism. Children with autism exhibit certain patterns in gut bacteria not found in children without autism. And so what can cause a child's interior bacterial types and levels to change? If a child is born by cesarean section, he does not, they do not go through the mother's uh, birth canal and pick up her microbes from her uh, system. So they're deficient in those that would be naturally passed to them had they been able to be born the usual way. Or a mother 
may be given multiple antibiotics when she's expecting and not have her system replenished with probiotics. I take an antibiotic well, probably once every five years whenever I find a Lyme tick um, that, I, that I know has been on my body for more than 24 hours. I do take antibiotics, a, a one a 30 day antibiotics, because that's the best way to stop the development of Lyme disease. And once you get it, it's really hard to get rid of. So I use that as a Lyme prevention. But at the same time that I'm taking antibiotics, you take them separately. But I take the antibiotics, I let them do their thing, and then I pay, take probiotics to replenish the gut the bacteria in my gut so that my digest digestion is not ruined. So you take the probiotics after you finish the antibiotics or during? During, but I and take after. it at a different time of day. Okay. So that I'm not stopping the antibiotics action, but that I am coming in and giving probiotics, which help to replenish because the antibiotic will kill off more. And I don't want to have 30 days of no beneficial bacteria or very little in my gut to wreck digestion and all of that. And also when you're taking antibiotics, you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so the probiotics can help um, help your digestion so that the body doesn't have to do so much work to digest all that food without the appropriate bacteria and microbes to do it. Uh, and then after I finish the 30 day, then I stay on the probiotics for another 30 days. So, um, so that's how you should be treated with antibiotics is followed by probiotics. Um, back to Dr. Uh, Perlmutter. Um, what they found is that the type of bacteria found in individuals with, in, with autism, but not in healthy children, create compounds that trigger an inflamed, inflammatory immune reaction, which in turn impacts the nervous system and causes the unusual behaviors that often accompany an autism uh, diagnosis. So two new studies show a connection between 100 genes and autism. But these genes are not all what mom and dad had. These genes are mutations that occur spontaneously in the egg or sperm right before conception. So there, it's believed that they are due to the autism risk gene interacting with environmental factors that are causing these mutations. And this impacts early brain development. So a um, hundred genes are linked to autism, but many people carry these genes that never get it or have it. So it's not all having the gene. The genes can be turned on or not, and they can be mutated or not. Dr. Perlmutter orders a stool analysis for autistic patients to look at the health of their gut, and my naturopathic doctor did that for me as well, and um, that's how they diagnosed that I had a gluten intolerance. But he, Perlmutter advocates aggressive oral probiotics and vitamin D treatment with a very good success in reducing autistic symptoms. Fecal, microbi fecal microbial transplants, stool transplants, to correct a gut's microbial composition are not yet available in the United States. But Dr. Perlmutter reports the amazing changes in one of his autistic patients whose mother took him for Germany for this fecal transplant procedure because it was proving to be so successful in other countries. Um, and it was extremely successful in Dr. Perlmutter's uh, patient, and um, he reports that in his new book, which makes it fascinating. There's a whole chapter on autism, and I've just covered the surface of it, but it's fascinating, and I recommend the whole book because it talks about how um, the lack of good gut microbes are contributing to a lot of other illnesses as well. Mayo Clinic in Arizona first performed a fecal transplant in 2011 for a patient with severe Clostridium difficile colitis infection using a donated stool from the patient's brother. The patient left the hospital 24 hours following this procedure after having bedridden 
four weeks, according to Dr. Orenstein. So we hope that such a natural treatment for some of these illnesses, including autism, will be available in this country and not held up by the FDA. Next, what is your opinion of CoQ10 and uh, it was brought up by someone who was being treated for heart care. Okay. Coenzyme Q10 is present in every cell in the body, and it fuels your heart, so that her doctor was correct, and, and it increases the amount of ail energy available to the brain, to the kidneys, to skeletal muscles, and to a lot of other places. Uh, Coenzyme Q10 has been used for, in Japan for decades to strengthen the heart muscle. Uh, it helps prever preserve your brain's structure. It slows damage to neurons in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's. It fights migraine headaches. It protects lung function. It fights diabetes. And it's just essential to a lot of things. So it's, and it's a very potent antioxidant. So if you have excessive inflammation that's causing arthritis, get coenzyme Q10 and add it into your arsenal because it scavenges the dangerous free radicals that uh, contribute to in inflammation. And this means it also helps slow down aging if you're uh, battling with that one too. Um, I want to tell you how I first became aware of coenzyme Q10. Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who is a terrific cardiologist here in Connecticut, um, now retired but still has a website, still does lectures and writes books. Um, he agreed to write the introduction to my first book, Healing Depression and Bipolar Without Drugs. And because what I didn't know when he agreed, uh, I'd been introduced to him through a friend, and she told him about the book, and he agreed to read it, and then he agreed to write a, um, um, a introduction to it. He had bipolar in his family, and so he was very curious about what I was doing. But he was also open-minded enough to be curious and want to not just discount uh, something because it was a holistic um, solution. And so I was planning to write a different book, and each chapter was, this was my first book, and each chapter was going to have um, a story about a different serious illness that had been healed holistically. And so Dr. Sinatra told me about a man that he had treated in um, South or North Carolina who had, and I, this was 10 years ago, so I haven't, I can't remember the man's name, but um, he had been, he'd had a, a heart problem and a, a virus had attacked the muscle of the heart. And by the time they figured out what was going on, his heart was severely damaged. And so he uh, had been told by the cardiologist that they would do what they could for him, but he needed to put his name on a heart transplant list because there's always a long wait. And so they're doing the best they could, but uh, he really didn't want to have a heart transplant. He had three teenage children. He was in his 50s. That was the last, and he knew that the uh, life after having a heart transplant is not you may be living, but it's there's still a lot of challenges that you face. So it just so happened that Dr. Sinatra was giving a lecture in that state on the benefits of coenzyme Q10. And being a car cardiologist, um, he had a lot of credibility. And the nurse to the doctor that was treating this man with the uh, heart failure attended the lecture got the man to come and see Dr. Sinatra, and he put him on um, 300 milligrams of coenzyme Q10. And my recollection is he didn't add a lot of other supplements to that. It was just coenzyme Q10. And what happens is when your heart doesn't work right, his heart muscle, the heart is a muscle, and it has the uh, 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 ability to squeeze, and that's how it moves the blood through your whole circulation. And so that squeeze factor had dropped to, um, I think it was down to like 12 or 15. 
so it was barely functional. And they started the coenzyme Q10, uh, 300 milligrams, and Dr. Sinatra also tested all the different coenzyme Q10s on the market, and some of them didn't have any coenzyme Q10 in them, and some of them were not did not have a very potent uh, formulation. And so he hand-selected the best kind of coenzyme Q10, 300 milligrams, and then they started measuring this man's heart's ability to pump every month to see what was happening. And gradually, that pump number came up and up and up until it was in the healthy range, which I recall was somewhere around 70 or maybe above 70. And so they were astonished that one, this single thing could make such a difference. And so he went to the uh, heart transplant specialist that invented heart transplants in Texas at that time and had a full examination done by their team. And when the uh, Dr. DeBakey, I think it was, when he, he came into the room to meet with this man, he had a big smile on his face and he said, I have good news. Your heart's just fine and when you finish with it, I'd like it, please. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> so coenzyme Q10 is very potent and it is, but you need to make sure that the supplement you're getting is really good and I would like to refer you to Dr. Sinatra's website, Dr. Sinatra, S-I-N-A-T-R-A dot com, because I know that whatever he's selling will be a really good quality. What are some indications that you have depression? Oh, <clears throat> if you always feel sad, if you tend to be a pessimist rather than an optimist, if you have low energy, poor concentration, loss of interest or pleasure from things that you used to enjoy, uh, low self-esteem is another prominent um, symptom or feeling excessively guilty about what everything you may have difficulty sleeping or you may want to sleep all the time because you're trying to uh, escape your life. You may overeat to feed yourself, to comfort yourself, or you could have a total loss of appetite. So the symptoms are quite wide ranging, but the, the biggest one is to just never feel really happy, to be unhappy with everyone and everything in your whole life. And that's depression. It is. <laughs> Um, I read going gluten-free helps with depression and hyperthyroidism and went on a gluten-free diet for six years. I really didn't notice a difference in my depression. Any thoughts? Okay. I put these two questions together because um, depression has a lot of different causes. And gluten was apparently not one for this woman. Uh, if you've been on a gluten-free diet for... Um, you know, a year, uh, you should, and it, it, it should help your depression. Mm -hmm. But if depression isn't what's causing it, it may have no impact at all. Low thyroid is the classic cause of depression. When anybody has a diagnosis of depression, the first thing a doctor should do is check their thyroid levels. Um, thyroid le testing is not the, um, the ultimate answer. Sometimes the tests say that you have normal amounts of thyroid in your system, but yet your cells can't use it. And um, that is known as Wilson's thyroid syndrome. There are five populations of people who have this because their ancestors for hundreds of years or maybe decades experienced um, famine. And so when the body experiences famine for generations, it downregulates the use of thyroid. So the thyroid can't get into your cells as well as it gets into other people's cells. So you have thyroid resistance, much like some people have insulin resistance, and there is a genetic uh, inherited cause of that. I had that, and so if you have that, look for um, Dr. Wilson's syndrome, and Dr. Wilson has, um, he's in 
Last I knew he was in Florida. He has a website and he offers two books on Wilson's thyroid syndrome. Um, the other thing that, and the populations, if you know that you're Native American, Russian, um, Welch, Irish, or Scott, you may have this inherited um, thyroid resistance. So I had circulating thyroid levels were normal, but my body temperature was two degrees lower than normal. So we knew something else was going on other than, and it was that my cells were resistant and were getting taking in. And Dr. Wilson's website and his books will tell how to do that. My books tell about it too. Um, the other thing is, Brain concussions can be a very common cause. Um, depression is really prominent in uh, later years for football players, for anyone um, that's had a contact sport. Um, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, we all know that his Parkinson's and his uh, mental dysfunction was caused by the damage from boxing. Um, my depression was caused by a deficiency of omega-3 fatty acids. These are essential fats that the body must have. They're very low in the American diet unless you eat a lot of fish. And you have to be careful in eating too much fatty fish because then you'll get an overload of mercury and uh, PCBs and other things that are so common in seafood. So you need to not eat fish more than a couple of times a week so that your body can throw off those things and you need to look at the kinds of fish that you're eating. Salmon is usually pretty good uh, but tuna and uh, swordfish and some of the other sporting fishes are very loaded with um, uh, with metals. So you want the omega-3 fatty acids. The safest way to get them is to take supplements, um, omega-3 fish oil supplements that have been filtered for PCBs and metals and toxins. And so um, that's what I do, I take. And when I began taking them, I didn't know I was deficient in them and I had searched for about a year in trying to figure out what was causing my depression. My mania had been lifted by uh, doctors at a Chicago clinic that helped me figure out the cause of the mania, but it was different than the cause of the depression. So I was depressed solid without manic breaks for 15 months. And I had cleaned all the toxins out of my diet. I was eating very healthy. I was taking ideal supplements. When I added in the fish oils, my depression lifted in 48 hours and I haven't had any since. So the omega-3 fats are really essential to brain function. And so I suggest you try those for your depression. You also need to take with them vitamin D. 60% of Americans are low in vitamin D. And it's not just a vitamin. Vitamin D is also a hormone, one of the substances that directs all of the activity in your body, the regulators of your body. So um, you get vitamin D through sunlight if you're outdoors and if you're not in the winter. I take it year round, 4,000 milligrams a day. Um, a junk food diet high in fine, in refined carbohydrates. I used to feel so depressed after Thanksgiving. Yes. Because <laughs> I was eating, I was eating yams. I was eating candied yams, of course. I was eating candied yams. I was eating mashed potatoes with gravy. I was eating dressing. I, so I had carb, carb, carb. And then I had turkey, which, um, also contains a, a relaxant in, in a, a tryptophan that makes you sleepy. So there's a reason why everybody sort of takes a big nap after Thanksgiving dinner. But also, I always felt very depressed, and I didn't know why. I thought it was, you know, a big family event. But I, I like the holidays. So mm -hmm. it, it was a puzzle that... Um, so... Um, a junk food diet, heavy, heavy carbs, processed carbs particularly that go into your system quickly and um, have the ability to contribute to your depression. So um, you want to change your diet, get rid of trans fats. Trans fats, unlike the omega-3 fats, are heavier. They 
all of the fats that you take in are what your body uses to make your cell membranes. And the cells in your body communicate through the cell membranes. They bump up against each other and trade information. And so your brain cells particularly uh, need this. The omega-3 fatty acids are very supple and they're soft. And so if you get the trans fats out of your system, which are firm and slow down the cellular communication and replenish them with the good fats, then your brain will work a lot faster as well as be a lot healthier and you won't be as depressed. The next question is, how long should one use a supplement to decide its benefit? It depends on the supplement, the type of supplement. Single supplements often have benefits to, on cellular functioning that you'll never be able to perceive. I think you could take coenzyme Q10 and if you didn't know what to test for, you would, you might feel a little bit better, you might not feel anything because it's doing so many different things in the body. Um, what I found is if I'm taking a multivitamin and mineral, or a combination of supplements based on a therapist's recommendation. I usually, and if I go on vacation and forget to take them with me, I usually feel really tired within about a week. It's like I start to run out of these nutrients and my body's slowing down and I have less energy. And if I'm taking them on a regular basis, I start taking them again, the energy comes back up. And so when I started, um, using therapeutic levels of vitamins and minerals to just make sure that my body had everything it needed to work right, my energy was really wonderful. And people would come up to me and say, gee, you look great. What are you doing? And after I used fish oils for six months, they said, gee, you look really great. Your skin is wonderful. What are you doing? And it was those good fats that was coming into it. So, um, so, when you adopt a holistic approach, instead of side effects that are negative, as with many medications, what you have is side benefits. And I heard one doctor in his 90s joking and said, yes, these give you side benefits and you're probably going to live a little longer. Would that be a problem? <laughs> <laughs> I like that doctor. He was great. What can parents do to reduce attention deficit? Okay, um, I'm going to cover the basics here because sometimes that's all that's needed. Mm -hmm. um, give your kids three healthy, healthy meals and in some children, two healthy snacks. Um, this provides a steady flow of fuel to the brain and to the child. And depending on the child, they can burn a lot of energy or they cannot. And so you need to judge. I was a high metabolism person and still am. So when I was starting to make myself well, I had breakfast and then I had a snack about 10 o'clock and then I had lunch about 1 o'clock and then I had a snack about 4 o'clock and then I had dinner at 7. And so the snacks were healthy snacks. You know, it was like cheese and crackers or a handful of nuts and an apple or something just to give me a little bit of healthy nutrition to get me through until the next meal. And it kept my blood sugar stable, which in those with mental uh, dysfunction, it keeps your mood stable. Mm -hmm. And that's what you want in children as well, so that they don't um, have a meltdown. So feed them appropriate small meals and a little more frequently and if they appear to need it. Put kids to bed at the same time every night and early enough so that they get eight hours of sleep at least before they have to get up in the morning. My rule for myself is I go to bed so that I wake up naturally when I need to wake up. And that means that I've had enough sleep. And so pay attention to when, whether your kids are hard to get them up. Um, and if they're groggy all day, um, that means maybe they need a little more sleep. So. Um, depends on the age of the child, too. Teenagers actually need a, a lot more sleep than little kids sometimes. And you're training the body, too. If it goes to bed at the same time every night and wakes up at the same time in the morning, it develops a pattern, and then it becomes easier to fall asleep that way. Your body's ready. To, it says, oh, it's bedtime, ready to go to sleep. So it, it gets into a rhythm and a cycle, a sleep, natural sleep cycle. 
uh, limit television and video to a couple of hours a day. Many different reasons, but research is showing that kids that are wired all the time are really wired in a lot of different ways. When you put a child in nature, when you take an adult in nature too, the stress levels come down, they relax. They will learn things that they will never learn online. They learn to entertain themselves instead of needing a device to provide entertainment, which stimulates creativity. And, um, you know, so kids need physical exercise, which is next on my list. Create at least an hour of physical exercise after school before you ask them to do more homework. Their brain will look, uh, work a lot better, and they need time to run around and blow off steam and have fun, get some oxygen in their lungs, and then it gets into their brain, and everything will work a lot better. So give them a break. That's what they used to have recesses for. People were knew that, and now recesses, I guess they stand around and do nothing and not required to do anything. Mm -hmm. So. Kids need exercise. Everybody needs exercise. But especially if you've been sitting in a school all day or sitting in an office all day, you really need exercise. And otherwise, you may have attention deficit. Um, and if the attention deficit uh, symptoms are severe, consult a naturopathic doctor. Try to work to figure out what the cause is. Or you can consult a, um, a um, I'm trying to think, natural. No, this is another system that is a computerized system that um, they can identify and treat. And I talked about it for pain. Um, I'll, I'll give you that in just a minute. So, but you want to figure out the causes. And while um, Lois is looking at the next uh, question, I was actually find that looking answer. at the pain. Answer. Okay, <laughs> so it is neurofeedback is yes. really great for attention deficit. So find a neurofeedback practitioner and uh, you can treat attention deficit because that corrects the brain waves that are stuck out of balance. And it's um, easy therapy and, um, and it's a really great way to go. How would you advise a person on all the psych meds professionals have them go on to get off the meds safely and transition to all natural methods? How well do natural methods work while still on meds? There are thousands of people across the country. When I was writing my first book, I thought, how am I going to, I'm not a practitioner, how am I going to find people that have healed themselves holistically using something other than drugs? There are thousands of them, and I was led to them by friends who knew people. And so uh, my first book had, each chapter began with the case history of one person, uh, who use psychiatric meds to end their either that book was all about depression or bipolar so to end either depression or bipolar but it's still my second book covered nine different mental diagnoses and how to treat it holistically and the first half of the book talked about the things that apply to all nine different diagnoses that are across the board can be one of the causes so this is uh, there are specifics that are unique to each person and so you need an experienced holistic practitioner who is experienced in treating mental health. Naturopathic doctors, most of them can treat depression and attention deficit and the simpler um, psychiatric disorders very easily through their training. Only in more recent years have they, some of them been trained in treating um, bipolar and schizophrenia and autism Doctors who treat autism holistically tend to treat only autism. They tend not to treat other disorders because it's so complex and um, requires so much education and knowledge on their part. <clears throat> so um, when you are looking for um, getting off psychiatric meds, it's quite different than other meds. You may have been on them. They have... When people t try to go off psychiatric meds without proper experience supervision, what happens is they, their symptoms come back immediately. But what they don't realize is this, this return of these symptoms is a part of the withdrawal. The brain is used to having these drugs. If you deny it, the drugs 
all these symptoms will and others will appear. So you have to go through a really sort of a rough patch, just like people on street drugs that go through withdrawal have a very difficult time. They're not easy to get off of, and you really need somebody that knows what they're doing. And it's good to educate yourself so that you know what to expect. Um, I recommend a book by Dr. Peter Bregan, who is an MD and a psychiatrist, and he's been called the conscience of psychiatry because he has been against these drugs um, his whole career because of the side effects and um, the difficulty of getting people off of them, too. So um, a holistic doctor will test for, the, take a whole history of what your symptoms are. I'm still talking about psychiatric, what your symptoms are. Then they'll do a range of lab tests. They look at what's wrong with your whole body because that gives them clues as to what may be impacting, causing your mind to dysfunction as well. We are a whole package, so they're called holistic because they look at the whole and then see how it might be impacting your brain. And you will, they will commonly do some lab tests to check for nutrient deficiencies, such as thyroid or um, uh, others. And, um, and it's a very systematic approach. And then they will suggest you try this and you try this and you'll go away and call them if you have any problems. And once they get you more balanced from taking nutrients, then they will gradually start to wean you off psychiatric meds. And some of them require that you be working with a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist um, to do that too. It depends on the uh, holistic doctor's uh, training and knowledge in, um, in mental health as well. So it's often a two-part um, collaboration, uh, three-part, you and your holistic practitioner and a mental health practitioner as well to get you off of psychiatric meds. But it is a, a process and it's not an easy one, so don't try to do it on yourself because you'll crash and you'll end up in the hospital. <clears throat> and um, in a psychiatric hospital, you'll come out on five different medications. <laughs> so I don't recommend it. No. <laughs> and not for at all. the other types of prescriptions, let me take a little drink here. Um, you need to find a doctor trained in holistic medicine again. This may be an MD, a naturopathic doctor, or a functional MD, medical doctor, who has gotten. Uh, more holistic training than what they get through the conventional medical school training. And these are becoming more common. <clears throat> um, they will, again, look at all of your symptoms and, um, and whatever you decide if you want to get off your blood pressure medicine, then they'll focus on holistic ways of doing that. And so it would depend on your priorities, where you start, but, um, you have an objective, you want to create a plan, what you're going to take instead of the medication or do, um, you know, change your diet, change your stress in your life to pull down your high blood pressure and have a plan and then put you on some supplements that they think are required for your body to function better. And then gradually they would start weaning you off of one medication at a time um, because you only do one at a time so that if there are withdrawal effects, you know which drug is causing them. If you try to go off too many at once, it gets too confusing. And so you don't know what the symptoms are and what the, what's causing what. So it's a process. Holistic healing is a process. Working, you work in collaboration with holistic doctors. And that's why when I go to my doctor, it's always an hour appointment because I have collected all of the questions that I have in the past six months when I haven't seen her. And we go through them and then discuss what, how she wants to treat, tweak what she's prescribed for me and what I'm concerned about now. Because as you age, continue to age, I've been doing this 17 years, the body changes. And so there's always a few new things that you need to look at. I have one more qu question on this. Okay. Would a functional MD be an integrative medicine practitioner? Yes, they also sometimes call themselves integrative. The newest buzzword is functional. Um, so there is really no, uh, it's, I think functional doctors belong to uh, a functional medical association. 
and I'm, but I don't think that there is still in place any absolute requirements of what they must have studied to be called functional or integrative. Uh, a doctor can call themselves integrative if they've gone to med school and if they've taken acupuncture, and that may be the only integrative thing they know. So you need to find out how experienced they are in doing holistic treatments and what they studied and, you know, uh, suss out whether they have the level of expertise that your particular problem requires. Well, I think we, we have about, I think we have a couple more minutes. So, um, let me see which question here we'll have time for. The, um, last one. the last one is, what are the best foods to keep the brain sharp and okay. what to avoid? Um, I That's a long question. So I guess what I'll do is I'll share with you what, in the next two minutes, the few things that I'm doing holistically to prevent Alzheimer's. I'm 67 years old. Because I've had depression a lot of years in my life, I have a much higher risk uh, of having Alzheimer's. So um, I am, um, thank you, we have two minutes. So uh, continue the anti-inflammatory diet that's on my website, crazyrecovery.com. I've been on it for 10 years. Inflammation contributes to all degenerative diseases, mental disorders, cancer, heart disease, and Alzheimer's. So you need to uh, bring your inflammation levels down. Your arthritis will come down along with it, and you'll feel a lot better. Daily exercise, aerobic exercise as you age, is vital. It is second on my list because a lot of people think, well, I'm old. I can be sedentary. It's natural. It's not mm -hmm. natural. It's not natural to decline. Yes, you can't fight it, but you need exercise even more as you age because um, you're not, the demands of life are not as great on you. You're, you're sitting around more. You're talking to people. You're doing things with friends that are your age. So things slow down. You need aerobic exercise and you need to push yourself to walk and not just meander. Walk fast. Get breathing. This will help your brain. The body produces brain-derived growth factor that stimulates growth of new brain neurons which will keep you sharp. So you need to use it or you lose it. And a couple of other things. Eat really healthy. The superfoods are salmon, blueberries, spinach, curry, broccoli, garlic, cinnamon, dark greens, and a plate full of vegetables. And especially older people, get your vitamin B12 tested with the methylmalonic acid uh, B12 test because this will help you avoid the mini strokes. B12 is essential to brain function. When B12 levels are low, you start to have lapses in your brain, and these are mini strokes that destroy parts of your brain. So you wanna make sure your levels are up there and that doesn't happen. Thank you so much for joining us. Tune in next week for more Ask Graceland questions.